Amen. It's Amen. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Amen. Yes. Thanksgiving and into his course with praise be thankful unto him and bless his name. It is a form of base ingratitude that we would not offer God the fruit of our lips. Amen, somebody. Amen. And by lips mean he mean open up your mouth Amen. and express adoration to me. Amen, somebody. I, I want some PDA, public display of affection. Amen. And I want it to be private. I want it to be open. I want you to shout from the rooftop what you what you feel about me. What you think about me. That's what God expects of us. He expects an exuberant praise and exuberant worship because he has done great things for us, hasn't yeah. 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 he? I'm grateful and just thankful God for his many blessings. And God keeps uh, more and more enriching my life. And I'm thankful to God just for the ways he has saw fit to do that. I'm thankful to God that he has given me knowledge that I have another sister. And she's here with us this morning. Amen, sister. Could you raise your hand? Come here before you have a new sister. Amen. Amen. And just, just to be able to get to know her and to learn and to grow and to build relationships is, is I'm excited about that. Uh, I think that this time God knows what's best for us, doesn't he? Yes. Amen. And we're grateful for God. God there's something about, about God. Relationships are not a means to an end. Relationships should be an end themselves. Amen, somebody. That we shouldn't just value people for what we can get out of them. We should value them. Amen. 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 That's the call for us. So I'm thankful to God for just the opportunity to have a new relationship with my sister. Thankful to God for you and your continual prayers for me. As I, you know, in a couple of weeks, that I will be in surgery on the 23rd um, to have the cancer removed. Amen. 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 And, and, and let me say this. That's a blessing. I want to praise the Lord for that. is never a light issue. No. Amen. It's never, that's a very serious thing. Yes. But God gives us the grace and the, the means to bear under it. Amen. God never puts you through anything uh, where he doesn't provide you with the means to bear upon it. He, his grace will never lead you. His spirit will never lead you where his grace cannot support you. Amen. Amen. God, will, God will uphold you under every circumstance. Yes. Amen, somebody. Yes. That he will make the life of Christ be evident even in your mortal body. He will show the power of Christ's resurrection. That's what I hope that he will do with me. That as I walk through this experience, this painful experience, that God will show his power in my life. Amen, somebody. And to be a witness for him. If you have the Bible, can you turn with me to the book of Amos? Amos chapter 7. We only want to read verse 16 and 17. And in your private moments, I would encourage you to read all of Amos chapter 7 because it constitutes the context out of which we will preach this morning. But due to the length of the passage and the limitation on our time, I only want to read two verses, and that is verse 16 and 17. And you have to say amen. amen. Before I do that, let me, let me go to God in prayer. Uh, gracious Lord God, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you have set aside for your people on this day. We pray that you would give us hearts and minds to not be apathetic or indifferent to those things, but that we would delight in fellowship with you. That being in your presence and hearing your word and being among your people and hearing the songs of Zion, that those things would not be a drudgery to us, but that they would truly be a blessing. And God, I pray that you would help us today, give us a desire to know and to love the truth and give us a mind that is able to comprehend it. And so we pray more and more today that you would illuminate us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may understand rightly the things that you have written in your word and that we may apply these things to our life and that any glory that we receive, let it redound to your name. Because we are not what we are by our own strength. We are what we are only by your grace and by your mercy. Thank you, Lord. We are your workmanship. We are your masterpiece. And you deserve all the credit and all the glory for anything that is good in our life. 
We thank you and we give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. In verse 16 it says, Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. Amen. Amen. Again, in the 16th verse, the B part says, The people of Israel say, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. I want to preach on the subject this morning, the stumbling block, or a fool's stumbling block. A fool stumbling block. You may be seated in the presence of God. A fool's stumbling block. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, speaks of a certain who stumble at the word. There are those Peter speaks of who stumble, he says, at the word. And by word he means either the essential word, Jesus Christ, or the truth of the gospel. And when Peter says in verse 8 that they stumble, he intends by that that they refuse to submit or receive the witness of God's truth. I know that that's the ultimate folly that man can commit. The greatest folly that men can commit in this world is refusing to hear from God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not listening to God, shutting your ears to God, the God who made you, the God who sustains you, the God who sent his son into the world to offer a propitiation and atonement for you. It is a great evil and a great folly not to hear from him. Remember that in the writer of Hebrews, in light of that, issues us a stern warning to God's people. He, he, he says, be sure that you don't refuse to hear the voice that speaks from heaven. That's in Hebrews 12. He says, be, be sure that you don't refuse to hear the voice that speaks from heaven. The voice that speaks from heaven is the voice of Christ himself. He's our mediator. And in that, he's issuing to his people a challenge to not be apathetic or indifferent or neglectful of the outward ministry of the word of God. Remember that in the book of Hebrews, the people of God were neglecting the outward ministry of God. God had communicated his mercy to his people through means, and the people were neglectful of that means. Thank God for the church. Amen. Thank God for local pastors who faithfully stand and who proclaim his word to his people. Thank God who do not, for, for pastors who do not lay aside the ordinances of God that he has committed and commanded of his people because God tells us to meet. Because God nourishes us and God feeds his people and he, and, 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 and he builds our faith through the communication of his truth in, in, in the word on Sunday. That Israel is issued this stern command to not refuse the one who speaks from heaven. And every time the word of God is faithfully being preached on Sunday morning, it is not the man who's doing it, it's Christ who's doing it. Yeah. It's Billy's voice, but it's Jesus' word. It's his message. And every time the word goes forth faithfully, Christ is the one who, who is his authority that's being communicated. And it's his spirit that makes that word effectual in our hearts. Yeah. Oh, beloved, that we should not neglect or be apathetic or indifferent to the outward ministry, the external ministry of God's word. That, that is, I feel like, the great sin in this hour. 
Amen. Amen. So many people are missing church. Amen. So many people are outside of the Christian fellowship. And the Bible says that, let me show you how important it is to be in church. Christ said that wherever two or three are assembled together in my name, yes. doing my business, doing my work, yes. there I am in the midst of them. Now, what greater motivation do you need to know that if you get together with other believers and as we assemble together, that Christ is going to meet us here, what other, what other motivation do you need? Yeah. That Christ is present with us as we do his will, as we do his business, that Christ said he would be with us. Yeah. In fact, in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, he says this, go into all the world. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Yes. Yes. Even up to the end of the age. Now the promise of Christ's presence depends upon the condition. He ain't going to be with you if you ain't doing his business. <laughs> and there's somebody. <laughs> he said go and the law follows the go. And there's somebody. If you ain't doing Christ, if you're not engaged in his work, if you're not in doing kingdom business, then Christ can't be, he's not going to be with you. But if you're doing his work, he will protect you. And there's somebody. He will look after you. You know, one of the great things I, I, that, that, that we can boast in the Lord for, for an entire year, we've maintained worship here. And in that time, you know one in this fellowship has gotten caught. That's by God's grace. Yeah. And that's about me. That's by God's mercy. That, 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 that if you do the things that God commands you to do, that he will, he will support you. He will protect you. He will fight for you. Aren't you glad that God's protected you? Aren't you glad that God has fought for you? Israel has neglected that. And I want, I want to open up, I said, I said last week that every week I'm going to open up the sermon in a new way, because I want to get more mileage out of the sermon. I want to find ways that you guys help you guys think deeply about the sermon. So I want to give you some questions concerning how we receive the truth. All right, I want you to ponder this. First of all, the question is not why you find it hard at times to receive the truth. How many know it's hard to receive the truth at times? Time? Raise your hand. I, I, I'm not going to ask that question. Why? I know why it's hard to receive church. The reason why it's hard to receive the truth is because of a stony, sinful heart. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. In Romans 7, the Paul says, when I would do good, evil is always present. Meaning this, that every time I want to do something spiritual, my flesh retards that. It fights against it. Yeah. It's hard to hear God's truth. It's hard to hear spiritual things. It's hard to hear God speaking to us because of a sinful heart. An evil disposition towards sin. We don't want to hear the truth. Yeah. We don't want to hear God's consultation. We rather follow our own devices, follow our own consultation. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You ever had a little kid ever, ever, ever tell you, you ain't the boss of me? Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I don't want any external authority guiding me or directing me. That is our natural fallen condition. We are, we, we are autonomous. We are a law unto ourselves. We don't trust God. We trust our way and not God's way. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, yeah. nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scope of his delight. Yeah. It's in the word of God. And in that word he meditates both day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in his season. His leaves not with her, and whatever he does shall prosper. That God, for those who keep his word, who follow his word, somehow they always land on their feet. That when you walk with God and you walk in integrity, God will always fix it when you always land on your feet. I receive that. The question is not why you find it hard. The question is not even if you find it hard. I know you find it hard. The question this morning for you to ponder as we get into the sermon is why or when do you find it most challenging 
to hear and receive the truth of God. And the wind is vital because the wind is a window, gives us, gives us a window into where we must grow in our sanctification. Yes. When is it hard for you to hear the word of God? When is it hard for you to receive the truth of God? The wind is vital. The wind, because the wind shows me what errors in my heart that remain unmortified. Yes. What blind spots in my own character, in my own life, yeah. am I refusing to, to see? Amen, somebody. And how many know that, 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 that all of us at, at a certain time, at a certain moment, find it hard? Hear the truth. Amen, somebody. So you, 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 you approach somebody about the truth and they're like, uh-uh, not now. Uh, not today. Amen, somebody. When is that for you? Now, I want, to, I, want, I, want, I want to flesh this subject out this morning under three headings. The first thing we'll look at is Amos' vision of judgment. Amos' vision of judgment. And then secondly, we'll look at Amaziah's malicious campaign against the prophet Amos. Amaziah's malicious campaign against the prophet Amos. And then third, we'll look at God's vindication of his servant, Amos. Number one, we'll look at Amos' vision of judgment. Number two, Amaziah's malicious campaign against the prophet Amos. And then three, God's vindication of his servant, Amos. Amen. Amen. Let's look first of all at Amos' vision of judgment. Look at verse number one of chapter seven. Are you there? Thus hath the Lord shown unto me. Now he, and Amos repeats the same idea, the same refrain three times in, this, in, 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 in the first nine verses. Thus hath the Lord shown unto me. These are visions of divine judgment. The initial visions are similar and contrasted with the last vision. There are three visions that are given, and the first two are similar, and they are contrasted with the, with, with the third and the final vision. The first, both two, the first two visions, both of them communicate and convey God's injurious intent, meaning God's intent to harm his people. The first vision he gives first is a symbol of a grasshopper. In verses 1 through 3, he speaks of a grasshopper or a swarming locust. Those of you who are familiar with the Bible are, are, are very familiar with the swarming locust. And their devastating effect on the land. They would come and eat up everything that was green. Bringing famine and starvation in the land, causing great death. However, when Amos sees the vision of the grasshopper, he does not interpret those things metaphorically. He sees these things as symbolic, meaning they're conveying a, a real, something real. That's the first symbol, the symbol of the grasshopper, the swarming locust. The second symbol is in verses 4 through 6. is the symbol of fire. He talks speaks of, of, of a great fire, a blazing fire that will burn up the depths of the city. So first of all, you have two visions, the first two, both of them communicating God's injurious intent, his intent to harm his people. Second thing I want you to notice this. I want you to notice that Amos goes in proxy for the people of God. Amos stands in proxy for the people. He stands on behalf of the people of God. Every time he sees a dreaded vision, Amos makes an appeal. Now get this, this, this is very important. Because Amos is a prophet, but he's performing the function of a priest. In the Bible, the prophet's job was to go to the people on behalf of God. The priest's job was to go to God on behalf of the people. But here you have Amos as a prophet performing priestly function. When he sees the vision, he goes to God, he says, and he appeals to God, God have mercy, God forgive us. Why? He bases it on the fact that Israel as a very small nation 
will not survive that onslaught. He appeals to God for his mercy in the hope that God would reverse his plans. I, can, I, can I just pause here parenthetically and say this to us? Who does that sound like? That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? That, 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 that the people of God are rescued and delivered from the danger of death through a mediator who pleads on their behalf. And we've been rescued from, from, from the danger of eternal ruin and eternal death through the sacrifice of Christ and through his... We've been saved because of his priesthood. Because he's the one in heaven right now who's interceding for us, who's pleading for us. He's the one who's telling God, God, don't give them what they deserve. He's the one who stood in our place and said, God, don't take it out on them, take it out on me. There's a prophet, <laughs> there's a prophet with, 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 with the priest's heart. And one of the things I, one of the I always pray for me as a pastor, because I know that one of my gifts is prophecy. I know I can be very heavy-handed and hard at times. I pray for a heart of a priest. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> it's one thing to, to be able to preach the truth. It's also a very important thing to be able to have a priest's heart. Yeah. Yes. To be concerned about the ignorant and the feeble and the infirm. Yeah. To be able to, 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 be able to, to, to sympathize. With people who are failing, because I'm one who's failing too. Yeah. And there's somebody. Yeah. The church is full of people who are sinners who are helping other sinners. Yeah. And somebody, nobody's perfect. All of us are in front. All of us need Christ. All of us need a Savior. All of us need a Redeemer. Yeah. God, every time that Amos makes this plea in the first two visions, God relents to do what he had planned to do. Now, let me say this carefully, because I, I want to make this very clear, that God is not changing his mind. Because somebody has the idea that if I go to God about something, if I just pray long enough, I can get God to change his mind. Not if God don't want to change his mind. Amen, somebody? What he's showing us is that the first two visions were a conditional threat. Sometimes God gives a conditional threat to elicit a certain response in his people upon which he will be gracious. Yeah. Meaning this, that if God gives you a threat and you change and you repent, then God will deal with you graciously because that's what God wants to do in the first place. Yeah. God has made two threats against his people. Amos the prophet goes in proxy for them. God every time relents because God, the threat that he has given in the first two has been conditional. The threat is to get us to change. Can I, can I say this? How, many, how much does God have to warn you before you change? <laughs> we often don't see how forbearing and how long-suffering and how patient God is, how much time God gives us to, to change. Yeah. 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 We misapply God's decrees and pop. We think because God has done nothing yet, that means he ain't going to do anything. God will judge you at some point. How many of the all of us are on the clock? You're on the clock. Amen, somebody. I don't know how much time you have, but I do know that God has a limit on his patience with you. Amen, somebody. At some, time, at some point, God will bring the hammer down. God, he, he's not a God who just makes idle threats. Let me say this as a Christian. When you read the word of God, and only since you believe every promise, you should believe every threat. Because God means both of them. That God will fulfill his promises, but God also will fulfill his threats. He's not like some of us as parents. I'm going to get you. And we never get him. And man, somebody. You ever see a kid who knows they ain't going to get spanked? Nah, whatever. Who knows they ain't going to get in trouble. They just keep doing it. They, 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 um, you must stop. Oh, boy, child. Oh, forget you. I ain't worried about you. Because they know you ain't going to do nothing. Yeah. But God will do something. Yeah. 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 Then, 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 this, then this last vision, he gets of the plumb line. Yeah. And all my years of being in the church, I've heard, I've heard hearing sermons out of the book of Amos. This is the only thing I ever remember hearing was Amos' plumb line. Yeah. 
What is the plumb line? In verse, look at verse number seven. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall by a plumb line with the plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Right. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. Now what is a plumb line? A plumb line is a line with a plumb. Amen. It's a line with a weight. And it was used as a vertical reference point to ensure that a, that, 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 that a wall was centered. And the way that Amos is using this plumb line is, 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 is to communicate to people that God is going to do a national probe. Amen. That God is going to do a strict examination into us. And he is no longer going to withhold his punishment. He's going to punish you. Amen. Now, beloved, let me say this. If God chooses to do a strict probe on any one of us, all of us will be judged and punished. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. If God was to regard our iniquity, if God was to look into your life and look into your heart and see what you really are, he would judge all of us in this room. None of us would survive. Yeah. Because all of us in our hearts are wretched. I'm going to say it again. All of us are willful. All of us are stubborn. We are like sheep that have gone astray. Don't for, don't for a second once believe that, that you are in any way different from that. that. That somehow you would be exempt. Right. Psalm 130 verse 3 says, Lord, if you were, if you were to regard iniquity, who, who could stand? God, if you were to impute and charge for our sins, who would escape the judgment? None of us would. Why? Because all men universally are wretched. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All of us are, 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 are wretched in our hearts. And let me say this. Well, well, Pastor, what is sin? What is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. You can sin by commission, meaning by God saying, don't do something and you do it anyway. That's a sin. <laughs> but you also can sin by omission. God saying, you do this and you say, oh, I don't, don't want to do that. That's a sin of omission. We can sin because we trespass God's law, or we can sin because we omit some duty that we should do. Yeah. But guess what? All of us are sinful, and when we do sin, God's judgment is set against us. Yeah. His judgment is set against us. That, 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 that God does not rule in the favor of those who violate his law or violate his character. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, God is holy. Yeah. Is God holy? loving, but he's, he's holy. <laughs> his, his love is holy. He tells in Israel, listen to says in Israel in verse number in verse number seven, I'm sorry, verse nine, nine, nine eight. And the Lord said unto, unto Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people, and I will not again pass by them. You see that? Meaning God said, I'm no longer going to tolerate it. I'm no longer going to suffer it to be so. I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not going to allow it to be so without check. That God, through his judgment, is going to check it. Amen, somebody. Yeah. And let me, can, I, can I say this? This is why we need a savior. Yeah. Yes. This is why this is so important. important. Because God will visit, us, visit his people at times in, his, in the way of his wrath. And if he visits us in the way of his wrath, which we all deserve, none of us will escape. That's why we need someone to be, to be judged on our behalf. Yeah, and that someone is Jesus. Yeah, yeah. He's wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we've been forgiven. Yeah, yeah. We need a savior because all of us violate God's law. And his law and his judgment is done against us. Do you know you need a savior? Yes. 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 I mean, well, Pastor, listen, I can't wait to get, get, get to heaven because when I get to heaven, my, the work, let the work that I've done speak for me. 
people say that at funerals all the time. Let the work that I've done speak for me. Let me say, you, you can never be good enough. You can never walk pure enough as a fallen creature to avoid God's severe judgment. But here's the good news. God sent his son from heaven to do all of that for you. He sent his son from heaven to walk for you on this earth 33 years to fulfill all righteousness. Not only that, he sent his son to the cross to bear the penalty that you had incurred for your sin. Because his son didn't have any sin. He imputed guilt to his son and he punished his son on your behalf. And if you put your faith in Christ, you ain't going to fear God's judgment. You ain't going to fear God's wrath. You have peace with God. And that's about it. How many of you want to have peace with God? You are not at odds with him. You are at peace with him if you put your faith and your trust in Christ. It means that God can never be judicially against you. He's always on your side. Here's, here's, here's the point. And, and hear, me, hear me when I say this. Although God is patient and long-suffering, amen, somebody. We thank him for his patience and long-suffering. He will not indulge sin forever. He will visit us, his people, in the way of, of wrath. Amen, somebody. And let, let, let me say this, why, why I think this is very important to us today. Why is it important to know that God will not indulge sin forever? The reason why it's important is for this reason. Put this in your notes. The wicked <laughs> desire exemption in sin. The wicked want to be able to sin and not pay for it. The wicked want to be able to sin and not feel guilty about it. See, that's the whole movement behind in, in, the, in the present culture. Judge not <laughs> about being non judgmental. I don't want anybody putting a fly in the ointment or, or, or a worm in my apple. I want to be able to sin and enjoy my party in sin without you messing it up. And then somebody. <laughs> People want to sin with impurity. They want to be able to sin with exemption. And let me show you a couple questions. Look at Psalm 10 and 11. Psalm 10 and 11. When you have to say amen. <laughs> he has said in his heart, that's the wicked, God has forgotten. He hides his face he will never see it. This is, how the, this is the mindset of the wicked. Look at Psalm 15 and 21. Another Psalm 15 and 21. You have it say man. Psalm 15 and 21. These things thou hast done. And I kept silent. And God said, I feel great. I didn't do nothing about it. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as yourself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before your eyes, meaning their sins. God says, because I didn't judge you immediately, you thought I was like you. You know how, how, how certain people are? We, are? we are complicit of other people's sins. We hide behind our own view. You say, no, well, I can't sin about them because I got my own stuff to deal with. God ain't like that. <laughs> God is never complicit. God, God sees your wrongs. He sees your evils. And notice that God says, I'm going to reprove. I'm going to set your sins before, in the light of my countenance and I'm going to reprove you. For, I'm going to correct you for it. Look at Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verse 7. When you have to say, man, Amen. 
Yet they say the Lord shall not see, not to the God of Jacob regarding. He means they're seeing. Beloved, God is holy. Yeah. And that's about it. <laughs> see, the, 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 the modern mind today, the modern culture, we have, we have an aversion to justice. Yeah. We, you know what's interesting about it? We, we, we preach a lot about justice, but in our hearts we have an aversion to it. We don't want to see any wrong action really judged, but guess what? God, if you continue... And you don't give heed to his warnings. You don't give heed to his promises in Christ. We'll judge you for it. There's an effort in our culture to make sin, the things we do normative, to normalize it, to make it okay. This is where the culture has gone. And calling good evil and evil good. It's one thing for me to commit a sin. It's something else to, to make my sin somehow right and to justify it in the on moral grounds. That's wrong. Amen, somebody. A Christian has always got to be able to say, God's law says this. I understand you say, you know what, at times, you know, I, don't, I don't know if I really want to do that. Okay. <laughs> I get that because you're a sinner and rebel at heart. But you still got to be able to say, Lord, your way is right. Your way is true. And it's right even when I don't want to do it. It's still right. And there's somebody. Even when I don't feel like it, it's still right. <laughs> even when I don't follow it, Lord, it's still right. Amen. I, you can never be in sin and complacent about it. You got to be able to say as a Christian that what I'm doing, I know is wrong. I'm just a rebel. Yeah. That's somebody. But God's way is always right. Yeah. How many know God has a way? Yeah. How many know that there's a standard for rightness and there's a standard for wrongness? Yeah. Well, you can't judge. Oh, yes, I can. The Bible says I ought to judge. Amen. The Bible says that we, we, we ought to make healthy discrimination. The Bible says we ought to make healthy judgments. That's part of our uh, us perfecting God's nature, uh, of perfecting Him, uh, perfecting ourselves as Him, as His image bearers. That God makes distinct distinctions. God says they're evil things, they're good things. Right, wrong, true, false, yeah. foolish, wise. Yeah. Now, if God does that, I can do that about anything that that, that, that you do. I can discern in my own mind, is this good? Yeah. Bad? Is it true? Is it false? Is it good or wise? And I can share that with you. You may not like it, but I can share it. Yeah. And there's somebody. Yeah. You don't have to like it. Sinners don't like it. My second point is this. Not, not just Amos' vision of judgment, but also Amos, Amaziah's malicious campaign against the prophet Amos. Look at verse number 10. Amos chapter 7, verse 10. You have to say amen. amen. Verse 10 says, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, don't flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel. It is the king's court. Now remember, Amaziah is the, is the high priest of the northern kingdom at Bethel. Now some background is important here. Under Israel's united monarchy, when it was divided, 
The first king was Jeroboam the first. And he is the great, great grandfather of Jeroboam the second. Remember that when the kingdom was divided, God had appointed a place of worship at, at Jerusalem. And what Jeroboam did, did instead was, he said, you know what? Because he feared that if the people went back to Jerusalem, then so would their allegiance. He established two cultic centers of worship in Samaria. One at Dan, one at Gilgal, and the other at Bethel. And he put people over those temples who were unqualified. And those temples were still and strong in full operation at the time that Amos comes to prophesy. And the head, the, the high priest of that temple, who was unqualified, is Amaziah. And he shows, he shows that he is deceitful and unjust. He shows that he is irresponsible and, sins and, and sinful in his office. Now, two, two, two things bear this out. The first, the first thing I want you to put down is this. I want you to see, I want you to see his dishonest manipulation of the prophet's message. There is a dishonest manipulation of the prophet's message. Look at verse number 10. When you have to say amen. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Amaziah is right. Listen here. Amaziah is right. In what he said. In terms of the content of, of Amos' message, he's dead on. Amos did say that God would destroy Israel as a land and he would kill the king by the sword. He is correct in how he interprets the content, but he is wrong in how he frames it. That's the key thing. He puts his own spin on it. And he infers something that is completely different behind the message, a different intent behind the message than what God had. Look at verse number 10. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam the king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. What he's saying is this Amos is a rebel rouser. His only purpose, king, is to incite rebellion in the kingdom. And therefore, Amaziah's only goal is to harm Amos' reputation and to force him out of the northern kingdom. It's not, he was not wrong in what he says. He is wrong in how he framed what he said. Now, let, 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 me, let, let me say this, church, listen carefully. Communicating to sinful people can be tricky. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Communicating to sinful people can be tricky. Amen, somebody. And I know that because I've been pastor, I've been doing it for 20 years. Communicating to sinful people can be tricky. And I people hear people say all the time, you know, you know what? It's, it's, all, it's all about the way you say something. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. No. No. You can talk to somebody and use kid glove treatment. You can be just as careful and delicate with what, in what you have to say and people will still be offended by it. And that's about it. I said because communicating with sinful people is tricky. Why? Because we have vanity and pride. And if you have a person filled with vanity and pride, you can speak in a whisper. It's not going to matter. When you got vanity and pride, something could be a small slight and it can launch into a big spike. Y'all catch that? <laughs> it's not that I meant harm by what I said. You took it wrongly. And Amos goes to people with the best intentions to say, hey, God don't judge you. Therefore, turn away from your sin. And instead of receiving that, Amaziah took him back to the king and said, king, no, what he really wants is to incite 
Brother Wyatt. He is dishonest. He is dishonest in how he handles the prophet's message. And, and, and I might as well park here parenthetically and say this. There are too many preachers and pastors who are dishonest mm -hmm. in how they handle the word of God. Amen, yeah. 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 somebody. Yeah. There's too many. And, and I'm sick of it. Yeah. I'm sick of it. Some of these preachers and pastors, they play to the gallery. Yeah. They, play to, they, they, they play to the popular taste. And therefore, they trim their, their faith and to, 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 suit, to suit the objections and the prejudices of unbelievers. Yeah. They won't say well, anything that unbelievers might not like. Yeah. Because I don't care if you like me on Sunday morning. Because I'm not here to please you. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. I'm not here to please you. You are not my boss. The Lord is. I have to please him. And sometimes I can please him and ain't none of y'all pleased. <laughs> Amos was pleasing the Lord, but Amaziah didn't like him. Why, why was it so hard for Amaziah to receive the message of the prophet Amos? Because the words that he spoke stung him. Amen, somebody. You know what he said? No, 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 no. He saw, he saw his own self-interest. He saw somehow that what he was saying was that, hey, I'm going to be out of a job. Amen. If God destroys this kingdom, this is where I work, then I'm not going to have work anymore. Amen. He is dishonest in how he manipulates the word. But also, listen, listen, he's also this. He shows himself irresponsible and sinful in the fact that he gives to, him, to Amos, he gives to him an unlawful command. Look at verse number 11. You have to say, man. Amen. But thus Amos said, Draw, draw bum shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also, Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer, go flee thee away to the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. That's what he said. He said, Listen, whatever preaching you want to do, Go do that back in Jerusalem. Amen, somebody. Don't do it here. <laughs> Don't do it here at Bethel, which is the, 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 the royal sanctuary is, and the king's court. Don't do it in the king's court. Go take your message. Go take it someplace else. And here's, here's what, I, what I want you to understand about the modern culture. More and more, more and more, we are becoming a people who cannot bear sound doctrine. We can't. We cannot bear sound doctrine. Because you know what? And, and let me say this. That, that there is a, a distinction here between the true and false messenger. And in, in verse 14 and 15, Amos says, I, I'm, I, I'm not the son of a prophet. Neither am I uh, uh, the prophet. He says, he said, I am one who was called as a sheep herder and a person who grew sycamore figs. And what he's doing is he's distinguishing himself as a true prophet. He says, I'm not like one of these, these professional prophets in Israel who say everything you want to hear them, you want to hear. Because that's what a false prophet would do. A false prophet will, will, will preach a message that will feed your pride, will feed your ego, and put you in hell. Didn't Jesus Christ say, you know a tree by its fruit? And by fruit, he did not mean that their conversation or manner of life, he means their doctrine and its effects. Yeah. He's saying that, 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 that a, a false teacher will say things that will promote everything that you want. And they won't say things that are difficult and hard for you to hear. Yeah. Amen, somebody. And I want to got the doctor. And they got to know the news that I had cancer. The last thing I want them to do is, is be a filibuster. The last thing I want them to do is try to convince me that everything's okay. If I believe everything's okay, then I would never treat it. Amen, somebody. <laughs> if I'm all right, God, then we okay. I can go home. No, just, you, you, you got, you got, we, got, we got to deal with this. See, when you know that you're a sinner, and when you know that God's going to judge you, yeah. you'll be pressing your heart to take a cure. Yeah. Amen, somebody. You see how that turns you to Jesus Christ? When you preach against sin, and, and, and I, I, I'm going to say 
of this. Most of what we get in, that, that passes for preaching on Sunday morning is not preaching, it's motivational speaking. It's a bunch of pop psychology that's going to stroke your ego. You, you, let me tell you this. You got to be careful about anything that contributes to exalt your pride and your ego. Because that's the sin of Satan, isn't it? Wasn't, wasn't Satan lifted up in his mind, hardy and conceitful and conceited and vain in his mind? See, when you are prideful and not humble and tumbled in your sin, you can't see the glory of God and what he's done for you in Christ. Yeah. Because somehow you believe that somehow it's still on you to, to get in and to help yourself make it in when you, you miss the fact that God has provided a way for you to get in and that's through his son. Yeah. God don't need your righteousness. Yeah. He don't need your goodness. Yeah. He's given you that in Christ. Yeah. When, when you don't preach sin, when you don't preach a hard message, people can't see the error of their way. People can't see their true peril and condition in which they lie in sin is one where God will judge them. And therefore they're not prompted, they're not stirred to seek an answer, a cure. The cure is not going to church. The cure is not reading your Bible. The cure is not turning over a new leaf. The cure is putting your faith in God's Son. That's the cure. Y'all heard what I said? What's the cure? Jesus. Who's the cure? Jesus. It's not your prayer. It's not your fasting. It's none of that stuff. That's your case saying you. It's not your endless crying. I love the song that says that, that these for sin cannot atone. Thou must save and thou alone. You can cry all day if you want to. That ain't going to save you. The one who saves you is Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Christ. Trust him. And my job as, as a preacher, my job as a prophet is to make you feel uncomfortable in sin that you may seek out God, that you may seek out Christ who is the answer for your sin. Yeah. 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 He's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. He's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is my final, my final point. I'm done. And, 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 I, and I'm taking my seat. Not just only, not only Amaziah's vision of judgment, Amaziah's malicious campaign against the prophet Amos, but lastly, God's vindication of Amos. In verse number 14, it reads, And Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore, <laughs> now therefore, heal thou the word of the Lord. Yeah. He said, I'm a true prophet. I'm standing in the full authority of God. Yeah. Listen up. And there's somebody. <laughs> that, that's how a preacher should walk. Amen, there's somebody. Those of you who want to be preaching, watch how I'm doing the money. You ought to stand up in your full authority. You ought, to, you ought to proclaim God's word, not in a very sheepish and timid way. Amen, somebody. Amen. My name is not Joel Osteen. I'm, 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 I'm bold. I'm, I'm going to boldly tell you what the Lord says. I'm going to cry out. It's fair enough. Amos said, I am a true prophet of God. Now listen up. And then at that moment, he arranged Israel. He arranged Israel for their great sin of refusing to submit to God and to receive his truth from a true messenger. And then he tells them what their dreaded punishment is going to be. He said, your wives will be prostitutes in this city. Your, your, your lovely sons and daughters will be killed by the sword. That your land will be divided and pillaged and polluted. Listen to the devastation. Listen to God's wrath and justice against sin. All because they refused to hear the voice of God's prophet. Yeah. There, there, there's a word over in Acts 3 and 24. And Peter is exhorting the people in the book of Acts. In the Sanhedrin. 
and he speaks of Christ as being the final prophet. He says, Moses predicted that there will be a prophet who will come that was like unto him. And he says, Moses said that him you should hear not in some things, but in all things. Lest you be cut off from the people. And he was speaking with reference to Christ. Beloved, Christ is communicating with us every week. The word of God is faithfully declared. The sacraments are being faithfully administered. The only question is, will you hear him? Will you hear him? Or will you be one who is unbelieving, unpersuaded, unmoved? You can treat me as a, every week if you want to, as a, he just up there just blowing smoke. It's gonna all come out one day at the judgment. It's gonna all come out. You won't be able to tell Christ, Dempsey didn't tell us. You won't be able to tell him that. Amen, somebody. Because if I have my choice, I'd I, I rather be immoral than, be, than, than, than be a heretic. <laughs> I'd rather tell y'all the truth. And it actually says this. This is, Paul, this is Paul's final words in Acts 20 to the church at Ephesus. And I always said that, that if I didn't live to see tomorrow, this is what I want people to say about me. I am innocent of the blood of all men. In other words, Paul is saying, if any of y'all go to hell, it's not my fault. Because I did not withhold from you the full counsel of God. I told you everything I was supposed to say. I said it when you appreciated me for it, and I said it when you didn't like me for it. But I said it. And if anything happened, I want you to know that a prophet has been here. Amen. Amen. Gracious Lord God, we thank you, Father, for your word today. Lord, let us not, by your grace, let us not stumble at your word. Help us be aware of those moments when we are most challenged to hear your truth. Help us use the tools that you've given to us to mortify those things in our heart that we may be humble, that we may be meek and receptive to all that you will say to us through the external means of your word, that we would not be resistant, that we would be accepting and embracing and compliant yes, Lord. to all that you reveal to us by your word and through the spirit. We ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and for his sake I pray, amen. 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 That's all we say.